Dream Theater and Bear Track Studios have had a, a very long relationship. We actually have uh, recorded many albums here. Uh, in addition to our latest album, we also did uh, the Change of Seasons EP here and uh, <clears throat> Images and Words back in 1991. And um, we have a lot of good memories from this place. Uh, you know, I remember being in that drum room, laying down uh, the drum tracks for Pull Me Under, you know, back in 91, and we really had no idea what the future held for us, and uh, it turns out that that ended up being a, a landmark session for us, and uh, really changed a lot of things for us, and it all began here. And this time around, for the uh, Metropolis 2, Scenes from a Memory album, uh, <clears throat> we had the really very cool experience of just being shacked up here. Uh, and it's the first time that we actually shacked up in a studio and wrote an album in the studio. Uh, in the past, we would be at our, at our home, you know, rehearsal spot, and we'll spend months and months and months writing the material, demoing it, and then, uh, then go into the studio to record the album. But uh, this time around, we decided to uh, just move into Bear Tracks, and we spent, uh, you know, a good part of 1999 here writing and recording the album simultaneously. And uh, that whole writing and recording approach was inspired by the experiences that myself and John Petrucci and Jordan had doing the Liquid Tension albums. It was very interesting and similar to the Liquid Tension album where when creating my drum parts, I didn't have uh, too much time to reflect on them. So similarly to the Liquid Tension album, I had to create my drum parts while we were creating the music and in some cases, you know, the next day I would be laying my drum parts down, uh, you know, and, and having to uh, record parts that I'm going to live with for the rest of my life, but, you know, only having maybe one day to, to refine them. So, uh, you know, breaking down some of these drum parts here for the purpose of this video, uh, similarly to the liquid tension uh, stuff I did, it's, it's, there's going to be some variations because I didn't have as much time to nail down and uh, completely overanalyze every single drum part. A lot of it was based upon spontaneity and improvisation and live raw energy. So to the best of my uh, capabilities, I'm gonna reproduce a lot of those drum parts for you here. In other cases, you'll see some variations. And in all cases, hopefully I will capture the uh, spirit of the song.
There were many things that made uh, writing the new Dream Theater record a lot of fun. Uh, first of all, writing a concept album is uh, a format that really was the perfect type of writing format for us because we were able to write as if it was one giant 75-minute song and we were able to constantly bring back themes and foreshadow themes and have themes played in different time signatures which is which is uh, a way that we've always written anyway within you know the context of s single songs now we were able to do it in the context of a, of a of a big album but the other thing that made the writing process so much fun was that we were writing uh, based on a concept of one of our older songs metropolis so throughout the entire writing process we always had free reign to uh to reference uh, a piece of music or a lyric or anything from the first Metropolis and, and constantly tie it in. Uh, the Dance of Eternity, the instrumental in the album, obviously utilizes a lot of uh, Metropolis bits and pieces. But the song Home, I think, really, uh, most of all, utilizes all different Metropolis um, bits and pieces. Uh, being that I wrote the lyrics to this song as well, I was able to write a lot of lyrical references into this. So, you know, for those of you that are insightful uh, readers or, or lyric listeners, you'll notice lots of references to the original Metropolis. Uh, musically, there's a lot of uh, references to Metropolis in this song. Um, the, the chorus itself uh, is actually uh, a progression taken from the first Metropolis. The uh, riff that comes out of the first chorus is taken from the first Metropolis. So beyond just the lyrical references and the band's musical references, I took it a step further and even had little drum references throughout the song Home. So uh, for those of you drummers that are familiar with the original Metropolis, I'm sure you've caught a bunch of these little wink winks, but uh, I want to just point out a few in case uh, they, they slip by you. Uh, the first obvious one is the fill that I do leading into the first verse. It's the same fill that I do leading into the first verse of Metropolis Part 1. So let me play that for you now. Okay, after I do that fill leading into the first verse, which is the identical fill from uh, Images and Words, um, I go into the same groove, just a straight downbeat pump. Don't, 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 don't. And then I actually play the Metropolis rhythm on the hi-hat while simultaneously playing the uh, pump, like this. So there was a, uh, a, a second drum reference to the original Metropolis. Then coming out of the first verse, I also uh, played the same fill that I played coming out of the first verse of Metropolis Part 1, which is this. One, two, three, four. Let me slow that down for you. And even slower. The similarities don't end there. Uh, the whole jungle groove that I'm playing on the second verse is the same jungle groove that I play on the second verse of the original Metropolis. So let me play that for you now. One, two, three, four. One of the grooves I'm playing in home uh, on the second pre-chorus of the song, it's a double bass groove, and it's incorporating playing 16th notes 
with my right hand um, on the ride bell and on some of the uh, stacks I have. Um, and basically, I think that was inspired, well, A, by Terry Bozio, who's always done these type of rhythms. But, uh, you know, once you stack these cymbals, uh, they're such quick sounding cymbals that you can start to play rhythms on them. So uh, a lot of the grooves that I play on the new Dream Theater album is incorporating 16th note or triplet patterns just on the stacks themselves, um, just because they're so uh, rhythmic. So let me break down the groove uh, I play on the second pre-chorus of the song. It's, it's uh, playing 16th notes on the bass drums and um, playing like straight downbeats on the snare. And then basically I'm just filling out the groove with uh, 16th notes following my feet on my right hand. And the first set is on the ride, then the second set is on the, uh, the, uh, the low stack. Then I do another one on the ride, then I do one on the medium stack. So let me play it for you at regular speed, and then I'll try to slow it down for you. One, two. There's a big fill that happens in the middle of the uh, guitar solo, and uh, it's another one of those traditional Mike Portnoy bag of tricks sort of fills uh, between the hands and the, and the feet, except um, what makes this fill actually cool is that the phrasing is backwards. Most of the times when I do these fills, it's starting on the snare and then going around on the toms and the kick drums, but in this particular case, I'm starting on the toms, moving up on the snare, so it's got a real kind of... Uh, um, backwards feel to it. And uh, what makes it even cooler is uh, after I laid down my drum tracks, John actually learned it and incorporated it into the guitar solo on top. So it's actually now the two of us doing it together, which is very cool. But anyway, um, let me play the fill for you at normal speed, then I'll break it down so you can see exactly what I'm doing. Okay, there's another fill that I do uh, towards the end of the song. It's actually at the end of the last chorus uh, before it leads back into the main theme. And uh, it's another one of these fills from, uh, from the Mike Portnoy toolbox. <laughs> so I'm going to play the fill for you now, and you'll notice it's very similar to the one I just broke down that's in the middle of the guitar solo, but this is more of a straight-ahead downbeat uh, version. So here we go. So all of these examples were um, to show you how uh, a drum part could be very memorable uh, by itself, even. All of these were grooves that hopefully you picked up on your own uh, without me having to point them out to you. Hopefully when you heard uh, Home for the first time, you caught all of these references. But basically they're an example of how the drums should always be a musical, uh, expressive instrument, not just strictly rhythms, but something that's going to create something memorable and that could be carried over, you know, <laughs> even from song to song.
of the things that constantly comes up at my clinics is uh, questions about double bass and double bass technique. And uh, it's something I've become very comfortable with because I've been playing double bass uh, for almost as long as I've been playing drums. And uh, I've always played with two bass drums. So uh, it's just something that's become very natural for me. It seems like it's a natural thing to do, that your left foot should also be, be as utilized as your right foot. Um, some of the advice I can give uh, on how to try to develop double bass playing and, uh, and be able to play it steadily, the very first thing I would recommend is to work with a click track or a metronome. And uh, Tama makes a thing called the Rhythm Watch, which I have mounted right here on my kit. And the Rhythm Watch actually is a very, very valuable tool. And uh, basically, you could pl uh, program or listen to quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes. You could program the different downbeats. It's a great, great tool for practicing any kind of grooves, but uh, for double bass, it's awesome. And uh, one of the most important things with double bass is to start slow. So many drummers sit down and they immediately want to start playing Slayer and Metallica songs, but you have to you have to start from the beginning first and start with those Motley Crue songs <laughs> and work your way up. And that's that's you know that's the way I developed. I started off learning just straight sixteenth note patterns, and then slowly as as time went on, uh, I would slowly kick up the metronome and bring it up and slowly start uh, to raise the tempo. And then, then I started to get more and more comfortable with the, uh, the, the quicker speeds. So let me break down for you just the most basic double bass pattern so you could sort of understand the way that it's uh, approached. OK, I'm going to start with just a basic double bass 16th note pattern. And what I'll do is I'll start with just a single bass and then I'll show you how you could bring in the left foot uh, on the upbeats. And basically, if you were to be playing with a metronome, uh, if this was your quarter note, one, two, three, four, ba, ba, the eighth notes would be ba, 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 ba. So that's what my right foot is going to be playing. Ba, 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 ba. My left foot is then going to come in on the upbeats. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. One, two, three, four. Anyway, what I was giving you an example of there was uh, you could see that I was bringing the left foot in and out. And when playing these patterns, I'll, I'll concentrate on my main kick, in my case, the right foot, always being locked in with that metronome, with the, with the downbeat, with the chord note, with the eighth notes. And um, no matter what the tempo is, I'll concentrate on my main kick being locked in. And, uh, and what I was just playing, pulling my left foot in and out, you were able to hear that the right foot was always locked in. So let me uh, show you how you could start to mix it up and play different patterns. Like for instance, we have a song called Under a Glass Moon off of Images and Words, and that's based off of these double bass patterns. Basically, I'm just playing uh, a straight beat. I'm going to show you how that beat sounds with only one bass drum, and then I'll show you what it sounds like with just a single left kick drum brought in, you know, every couple beats, how it completely changes the feel of the entire groove. So here's the under a glass moon groove with just one foot. So you could hear 
the under glass moon pattern with only one bass drum is really incredibly basic. In fact, it could be <laughs> the drum beat to an ACDC song. But as soon as you add in that left foot, now watch the completely different dynamic that it takes on. One, two, three, four. One of the most challenging sections on the new Dream Theater album is uh, the guitar and keyboard solos at the end of Fatal Tragedy. And this was a section that we called the shrink and grow section. <laughs> because uh, essentially what was happening is that when we wrote the rhythm tracks, um, we created a, uh, a rhythm section that essentially shrunk and took bits away and then at a certain point it played a unison thing and then it built itself back up and grew. So there you have shrink and grow. So this is the shrink and grow section I'm going to play for you. Uh, to understand, understand the concept behind it, it's, it's pretty twisted and it takes a lot of concentration to play. And uh, <laughs> the fact that John and Jordan are playing completely crazy solos on top of it doesn't help matters for me when I'm trying to concentrate on playing this. Uh, but essentially there's two sections. You have an E section, which is uh, let me check the key. Yeah, 
Very good. How's that for relative pitch? That's the E section. And then the second riff is an F sharp, which is da 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 and the F sharp. What we did was, rather than just alternating back and forth for a typical solo section, we tried to make it interesting and we tried the shrink and grow uh, technique. So what's happening is, we're starting uh, with the E section and we're doing a total of four E's. But on the fourth one, we're doing the riff. So essentially, the four E's would be then it goes to the F sharp, four F sharps. So that was four and four. Now we go to three E's. And remember, the last one is always the riff. So now the three E's is now three F sharps. Now to two E's. Two F sharps. And now this last one, we go back to E. Uh, it's just the riff because it's only one. So now that we've shrunk the entire arrangement, now we're going to grow. The, the arrangement's going to grow back to its original forms. And if you followed me this far, <laughs> not only are you crazy, but you're uh, pretty smart <laughs> because I'm still trying to figure this thing out. It's an absolutely bizarre concept and something that uh, was a challenge to write and and to actually execute. And I feel like a fool sitting here singing it and counting it for you, but it was the best way to sort of uh, describe what I'm talking about. So, now I'm gonna actually play it for you. Okay, when we hit the E right here, it's gonna be the top of the shrink and grow section. Three, four. Two, three, riff. Two, three. Now down to three. Now down to two. Riff. One. Two. Riff. One. Unison. Okay, now we're going to grow. That was the one riff. Now one F sharp. Two, riff, one, two, now up to three. Riff. Now up to four. Riff. Two, three, four, and there you have it.
Uh, through the years, I've done a lot of drum clinics, and at my clinics, if you've ever been to one of them, you know that I spend a lot of time talking about odd time signatures and breaking them down, uh, giving examples of how, you know, nine eight seven eight five eight, and uh, even sixteenth note subdivisions relate to four four time, and the one example I always give in sixteenth note uh, subdivisions is f grooving in nineteen sixteen time. And uh, it's weird because through the years at my clinics, I've always used that as an example, uh, just arbitrarily. And it turns out that the ending of the song Home ended up having a, a riff in 1916. So what I'm going to do is uh, explain to you exactly how to understand 1916, the same way I do at my clinics. And then I'll show you how I apply it to this groove in Home. OK, I'm going to try to. Uh, take a, a very large concept and squeeze it down to a, a very quick, understandable one uh, for the sake of, of uh, moving forward without taking up too much time on this subject. But uh, uh, the most important thing about odd time signatures is seeing how they relate to 4-4 four, four time. And I always say, if you use a drumstick uh, as a sort of musical timeline, you could see how everything relates to 4-4. Four, four. If you put 4-4 four, four smack in the center, uh, you could see that 3-4 is one quarter note less. You could see that 5-4 is one quarter note more. And uh, the same way that you would look at a ruler with inches and half inches and quarter inches, that's the same way you look at music with quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes. So for instance, in between 3-4 and 4-4, four, four, uh, which could be broken down to eighth notes as 6-8 and 8-8, eight, eight, in between those 3-4 and 4-4, four, four, you would find 7-8. Uh, in between 4-4 four, four and 5-4, five, you would five, uh, excuse me, find 9-8. So that's how to understand eighth note subdivisions. Now, um, now talking about 1916, uh, on the surface, somebody would completely be intimidated by that time signature and not know how to approach it. But if you understand it in your head first and figure out the mathematics and how it relates to 4, actually playing it is not that difficult. Basically, 1916, you're going to break it down into 16th notes and see how it relates to 4-4. Four, four. So 4-4 four, four time could be four quarter notes. If you were to break that into eighth notes, you'd have eight eighth notes. And then if you were to break it into 16th notes, you'd have 16 sixteenth notes. So 4-4 four, four time essentially is the same as 16 16 time. So let me play that for you. So, right there was a simple 4-4 four, four groove, but if you wanted to be technical about it, you can count it as a 16-16 16, 16 groove. So now, to play something in 1916, all you're going to do is play a 4-4 four, four groove, and then you're going to add three extra 16th notes. So if 4-4 four, four is 16-16, 16, 16, 1916 would just be 1-E and a 2-E and a 3-E and a 4-E and a 1-2-3-1-E and a 2-E and a 3-E and a 4-E and a 1-2-3-1. So let me play that for you. One E and the two E and the three E and the four E and the So there's 1916, as used in the song Home.
The number one question I get asked the most, other than, hey dude, why'd you cut your hair, is um, how the hell do you guys remember all that stuff? So what I'm going to do right now is show you how we remember all that stuff. We have a, a charting system, and uh, when we're working on writing a song, we'll spend a lot of time working on the arrangement and writing out charts. We have blackboards in the studio, or we'll each have our personal sheets, and besides the actual notation of the songs, the arrangement of the songs is usually um, just as confusing, if, if not sometimes more, because uh, our arrangements are sometimes very um, untraditional. So uh, what I have here is a whole bunch of notes. Uh, these, are, these are my charts from the making of this album. And uh, what, make, uh, what made writing this album even more difficult is that, like, I, like I've mentioned, there wasn't much time for reflection. So there was a lot of taking notes and a lot of uh, reading off of charts, trying to remember the arrangements. And uh, right here, this is, uh, this is the, the big instrumental chart. We knew uh, we wanted to write um, an instrumental on this album. In fact, we ended up writing two. One was it the overture for the album, and then the other was The Dance of Eternity. And uh, The Dance of Eternity basically was uh, a typical Dream Theater instrumental in the tradition of Yitzhak Jam or Erotomania, um, or even the middle of Metropolis Part One. And basically, when we write an instrumental, we just try to throw everything in, and uh, we just go for it. There's no rules, and anything goes. And with writing a, a big album revolved around Metropolis Part Two, we knew that there had to be this incredibly sick instrumental in the middle of Metropolis, the way that there was a, a crazy instrumental section in the middle of the first Metropolis. In the case of this album, the instrumental section sits pretty much in the middle of the record, and it turned into a whole six and a half minute piece called The Dance of Eternity. So knowing that we wanted to write this incredibly crazy instrumental, uh, we basically made a list of a lot of the crazy riffs that we had floating around. And this is the riffs du jour category. Originally, we had the Metropo Fest 99. But in any case, we had the list of riffs that we knew we wanted to incorporate, some of which made it, some of which didn't. And then as we went along arranging and writing the song, we ended up with the final menu in this case. And... Um, all of our sections are given crazy references. Uh, it's not like verse, chorus, bridge, solo. Uh, it's UK number one, piano break, uh, bass break, Meshuggah low, Meshuggah high, Zappa unisons, Cantina, Metallica. They, they always have references to other bands, sections that things remind us of, Marillion, Genesis. And uh, <laughs> this is the way that we remember the parts. So in answer to that question, how the hell do you remember this stuff? This is how we remember this stuff. Okay, so this is actually my personal chart uh, for this particular uh, song, The Dance of Eternity, which the working title was song number seven. <laughs> the entire album was songs one, song two, song number three, so we wrote the entire album. Uh, every song had a number. But in any case, song number seven was The Dance of Eternity, or the Metropo Mental. But uh, this was my personal chart. This was actually the the writing chart and the master chart, but once we got the arrangement down, uh, I created my own chart, and I do this for every one of our songs. So if you were to follow the arrangement of the song, usually I'll have uh, the, the, the arrangement name, you know, intro pump, UK number one, the amount of times. Usually on the left side, I'll have the key that the section is in, so I can, you know, refer to it when, when discussing it with the other band members. And then uh, on the right, you'll see sometimes I'll have numbers or odd time signatures, just a basic chart. I mean, this is obviously uh, amateur notation. If you were to look at Jordan's charts, he actually notates everything. But this is my sort of uh, shorthand way of remembering the arrangements, especially when you're writing the album on the spot in the studio. And to take it a step further, there was a section towards the end of this that got absolutely out of hand with odd time signatures. And this is the actual chart for it. And what I'm going to do is actually uh, count through this section of the song with you. So you could see uh, exactly all of the, uh, the odd time signatures that are constantly shifting and changing. And this was the actual chart that I used to uh, help me get through the, the recording of this song. It wasn't easy. So uh, we're going to play through the, uh, it's sort of the end of the instrumental 
of the Dance of Eternity. And uh, I'm going to just point along and count out loud and see if you could sort of follow all of the different odd time signatures as, as we go along. Walk with us, if you will, through the nightmare which we call the Dance of Eternity. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is what still gives me nightmares, but there you have it. That's the way to uh, count through the chart and make your way through the dance of eternity.
some lights up here. Light the stage up. Let's see this homeboy.
hang this thing back up and it won't get hang up on the hook. This is like f***ing Spinal Tap. This is, uh, this is my daughter, Melody. I'm gonna give her a chance to jam, see if she's better than these two. Okay, time for Daddy to go back to work. <laughs> 